Sharif Hussein ibn Ali ruled Mecca by the permission of the Ottoman Caliph. By tradition, the Ottoman Sultan had always chosen a local Arab leader from the Hashemite clan as the Sharif of Mecca. And as mentioned in the previous episode, Hussein ibn Ali was chosen in 1908. As the ruler of Mecca, Sharif Hussein was also in charge of the Hajj. At this time, the annual Hajj pilgrimage was the primary economic driver in the Hejaz. Camel merchants and camel herders were an essential part of the Hejaz's economy because camels were still the primary mode of transportation in the region. And Hajj pilgrims needed camels to travel from Jeddah to Mecca and anywhere else in the Hejaz. Even though Mecca was a part of the Ottoman Empire, it had always been relatively autonomous. It was just too far away from Istanbul. Furthermore, the empire's poor communications and transportation networks prevented too much oversight from the imperial government. The Young Turks wanted to change that. They wanted to increase government authority over Mecca and the rest of the Hejaz. One way they were going about doing this was by building a railroad from Damascus to Mecca, which would eventually also go to Jeddah. Naturally, the camel merchants opposed this plan as it would destroy their livelihood. Sharif Hussein ibn Ali was also opposed to a railroad in the Hejaz. Sharif Hussein was loyal to the Ottoman Sultan, but he did not like the Young Turks. Unfortunately for Sharif Hussein, the Sultan no longer had any political power after the Young Turk Revolution of 1908. True authority in the empire was now with the Young Turks. Sharif Hussein ibn Ali wanted to maintain the tradition of Mecca as an autonomous province within the Ottoman Empire. And a railroad line threatened all of this. With a railroad line connecting the Hejaz to Damascus, the Young Turks could easily ship troops into Mecca at a moment's notice. If they ever wanted to remove Sharif Hussein from power, they could have thousands of troops in Mecca in a matter of days, if not hours. Just like Sharif Hussein ibn Ali, many Arabs in the Ottoman Empire did not care for the new young Turk regime. Now, to be fair, most Arabs in the Ottoman Empire were loyal to the government. However, some were beginning to feel alienated by the Young Turks' nationalism. There was a perception that Arabic-speaking people could never reach high positions of government. This perceived discrimination prompted some Arab elites to develop a form of Arab nationalism. Arab nationalism was a new thing and had not really existed in the Muslim world until recently. It was not even clear what exactly was an Arab. The Arabic-speaking peoples of Mesopotamia, the Levant, Egypt, and North Africa were a mix of several different ethnic groups. Furthermore, only a few Arab intellectual elites were promoting this Arab nationalism. And most of these intellectuals lived in Cairo, which was under British control, where it was safe to discuss such matters. Before the Young Turks, all forms of nationalism were prohibited in the empire. After all, if you think about it, an empire is made up of many different nationalities and ethnic groups, and it cannot tolerate any single group thinking it deserves special privileges. Therefore, before the Young Turks, both Turkish and Arab nationalists had to conduct their business in secret. But things changed when the Young Turks took over the government. Now, the Turkish nationalists could openly discuss their plans and goals, but Arab nationalism was still illegal. This prompted the Arab nationalists to create secret societies and clubs to promote Arabic literature and separatism. Most of these secret societies were based in Damascus, but before long, they were starting to infiltrate Mecca. Before World War I started, the Arab nationalists had attempted to conspire with local chiefs in the Hejaz to revolt against the Ottomans. Some of them even invited Sharif Hussein to join them, but when he refused, they labeled him a Turkish puppet. Hence, with the world descending into war, Sharif Hussein found himself at odds with both the Young Turks and the Arab nationalists. In the summer of 1914, Sharif Hussein's son, Prince Abdullah met with British officials in Cairo. At this time, the Great War was just getting underway, but the Ottomans had not yet joined. 
Abdullah was concerned the young Turks were planning to remove his father from power. Abdullah wanted to know if the British would support his father against the Ottomans. Prince Abdullah led the British to believe the Arab tribes in the Hejaz were ready and willing to revolt against the Ottomans. But of course, this was not true. As we mentioned earlier, most Arabs were loyal to the empire. Initially, Horatio Herbert Kitchener, the British governor of Cairo at the time, was against this idea. After all, the Ottomans had not yet joined the war and there was no sense in provoking them by supporting a meaningless revolt. Quick footnote, Egypt was technically part of the Ottoman Empire at this time. However, Great Britain had occupied Egypt since 1882 in order to protect their access to the Suez Canal. So, even though Great Britain had not officially annexed it, for all intents and purposes, Great Britain ruled Egypt. Okay, back to the story. Not only did the British believe Prince Abdullah's exaggeration, they completely misunderstood him. Prince Abdullah only wanted the British to support his father if his father chose to revolt against the Ottomans. He was not talking about all the Arabs in the Ottoman Empire, but that's what the British officials in Cairo believed. They thought most Arabs felt the same way about the Ottoman Empire as Prince Abdullah did. Remember, Cairo was the home for many Arab nationalists. British intelligence in Cairo was well aware of their meetings and discussions. The British took this Arab nationalist sentiment and, along with Prince Abdullah's request, came to the conclusion that there was an overall Arab hatred for the Turkish rulers, which was simply not true. Of course, there were some Arab leaders including Sharif Hussein ibn Ali, who held grudges against the young Turks or perhaps had their own ambitions. But these were the elites of Arab society and only represented a small fraction. Nonetheless, while this was interesting information, there was nothing the British would gain from supporting an Arab revolt. Since the Ottomans were not in the war, there was no need to act on this just yet. In fact, the primary concern for the British at this time was the Hajj. As mentioned earlier, Sharif Hussein was in charge of the annual Hajj pilgrimage. The British did not want any disruption in the Hajj to cause anger amongst their Muslim subjects during the war. Instead of offering to support a revolt, the British reached out to Sharif Hussein, encouraging him to keep Mecca open for the Hajj. A few months later, when it became clear the Ottomans were going to join the war on the side of Germany, Britain's attitude changed. They remembered that visit from Prince Abdullah and wanted to know if the offer was still available. Lord Kitchener sent a message to Hussein ibn Ali promising British support for an independent Arab state if he assisted against the Turks. This is where more exaggerations and misunderstandings muddied the water. Kitchener's initial intention was to only support an independent Arab kingdom in Western Arabia. But as his discussions with Hussein ibn Ali continued, he went on to include the entire Arabian Peninsula. And then, Kitchener made the mother of all goofs. He told Sharif Hussein ibn Ali that he could be the next caliph. Kitchener said the caliph should be an Arab instead of a Turk. Of course, Herbert Horatio Kitchener had no idea what the caliph truly represented. In his mind, the caliph was just a spiritual leader similar to the Pope. He did not comprehend that throughout most of its history, the caliph had been both a spiritual and a political leader. Hussein ibn Ali, on the other hand, understood something totally different. Sharif Hussein ibn Ali was an Islamic scholar. He fully understood the implications of the Islamic caliph and the history of the caliphate. In his mind, being caliph meant being in charge of most of the Muslim world. This was not just spiritual leadership. Sharif Hussein thought the British were offering to make him the political leader of all Muslims. At the end of the day, however, Sharif Hussein ibn Ali was a politician. He came from a political family within a political clan with political connections throughout the empire. He knew how to delay, play one group off another, answer questions without actually answering questions, and keep his rivals and enemies at bay. 
and a lot of people wanted a piece of him. For instance, the Arab nationalists in Damascus and Cairo who wanted his help rebelling against the Ottomans, and the young Turks in Istanbul who did not trust him. They were not yet aware of his son's visit to Cairo to meet the British, nor his discussions with the Arab nationalists. But they had their suspicions. And then there was Great Britain and its powerful military sitting right across the Red Sea in Egypt. If they wanted to, the British could easily conquer the entire Hejaz. And finally, off to the east was one of his greatest rivals. Abdul Aziz ibn Saud was steadily expanding his hold on the Najd and Central Arabia. Sharif Hussein ibn Ali played politics with all of them. He met with the Arab nationalists and discussed revolution without committing to anything. He promised the young Turks he'd send troops if they sent him money to raise an army. Then he never sent them a single soldier. When British intelligence reached out to him asking for his support, Sharif Hussein did not commit to anything, but he did not turn them down either. He reached out to Abdul Aziz ibn Saud and discussed how Mecca could assist the caliph in the war. Sharif Hussein gave his opinion, but never made any promises. Sharif Hussein ibn Ali was doing everything he could to maintain Mecca's independence long enough to see which way the wind blew as the war progressed. So what finally pushed him over the edge? What convinced Sharif Hussein to betray the Muslim Ottoman caliphate and side with the Christian British Empire? Inshallah, we'll answer that question in the next episode.